you know, I don't know whether I should start more in my portfolio. I don't know whether I should start writing game music packs. I don't know whether I should start going on Twitter and looking for devs or whether I should do all of it. Where do I begin when there's so much that can be done? Hey, what's up, William? Thank you so much for making time today. I'm really excited to have you here on the Become a Game Composer show. I'd love to know, what has been your favorite content of mine so far that you've experienced, either reading or, or watching a video or anything like that? Just curious. Probably the live composing that you do. I don't know if there's a specific one. There was one, I, I don't think I've actually managed to catch one live, but I always will watch them after. Um, I can't remember, there was one that I really liked. Uh, I can't remember if it was the Sun Temple or something like that. It was that kind of name. They all kind of blur into one because sometimes I just put them on in the background while I'm doing other things because I always like to hear how people start with an idea and then what that idea becomes. Yeah, sort of well, thing. that's awesome. So the, I find those most useful essentially because I just like seeing people's processes. It's like, you know, I've gone from this little idea, then it becomes this. And also, that's one thing I struggle with is I'll write something small and it's like, oh, I don't know how to put anything else around that now. Yeah, well, that's awesome. I think you're referring to... The Sun Temple was from Monster Sanctuary. That was a game I just finished yes, up uh, about a well. month ago. Well, that's awesome. Um, I'm curious. So even just from watching the live composing show, have you noticed any changes in your own game composition career as a result? It made me feel like I look at my work and not be frustrated with it as much and think that I'm not going to write something and then leave it and think, okay, that's a project that I'm never going to finish. Although it makes me feel like, okay, you know, I've got something here. I can adapt it. I can do something else with it. I can try some new things with it. Um, it's made me think about maybe trying and do some live streams of my own at some point. Um, just because I think it's quite a nice thing to share with people. I would highly encourage that. I feel like yeah. with live streaming, I don't know if you ever get comfortable with it. Um, it still scares me to death and I've been doing it for a couple of years now. And especially when it comes to composing, there's something about, it takes a lot of boldness to do that, but I feel like once you kind of get over that hump and just practice, 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 there's something about having other people in the room with you that mm. it, it encourages you to almost write music differently. And it's forced me to almost, it puts me in almost a teaching position where I'm having to explain my choices. Mm. And when you're doing it by yourself, you don't have to explain anything. You're just experimenting and yeah. playing. But it's just crazy how much it has actually sped up my writing. So now when I sit down to write, I know that what used to take me three hours to do one minute of finished music, it's now taking me one or two hours because that's just how I've conditioned myself. I'm not even sure that's the healthiest speed. <laughs> but <laughs> but it, it's cool to know that I can do that. I can punch out yeah. the deadlines if I have to. Um, so yeah, I would highly encourage doing that as soon as, I don't even want to say as soon as you're ready or comfortable, just do it, just try it and see how that goes yeah. for you. Yeah. Well, in any case, uh, I'm really glad that you're here and we can have a little chat today. So how can I help you? Well, well what's funny was one of my, uh, questions that I wanted to ask you that I wrote down is probably being answered in the latest, uh, podcast that you uploaded about <laughs> two hours ago. Oh, I haven't awesome. seen it. I just saw the title. Um, <laughs> One thing that essentially in my situation is that I've had some very small projects um, and usually it's for people that they say, okay, I want to make a game. I don't know what the game's going to be yet, but I'm already coming up with concepts. Therefore, I want some music to go with my concepts kind of thing. So it's they don't want music ready for their game, if that makes sense, or mm. they've definitely jumped the gun and they want music nice and early when things haven't really got the ball rolling. And so I'm quite happy to do that. But then I also know that, okay, I'm never going to speak to this person again because they're probably not going to get to the stage where the game actually becomes something that, you know, people can play. I almost want to ask, where should I start? Because, I, you know, I've got, I'm, I'm slowly building a website, but it's very bare bones. Uh, you know, I don't know whether I should start more in my portfolio. I don't know whether I should start writing game music packs i don't know whether i should start going on twitter and looking for devs or whether i should do all of it sort of thing bit by bit it's almost just you know where 
where do I begin when there's so much that can be done? What have you tried so far or what have you considered trying first? I've done a little bit of Twitter of reaching out to people. Um, there was one situation where I got shortlisted, um, didn't get the final gig, but he did get back to me saying that if his budget gets a bit tighter, he'll come back to me because I was one of the cheaper options, apparently. <laughs> but it was nice to get shortlisted anyway. Um, so I've tried, you know, messaging a few people. A lot of the time, they'll, they found someone in the space uh, between me messaging them and then getting back to me. Um, I know you don't like Fiverr, but I'm on, uh, I've been on well, Fiverr and I have yeah. had, had a, a couple of gigs from there. I think it's okay. It, it's a platform that you have to know what it is. Like you have to understand the room that you're walking into that I've actually, I've met composers who have actually have, they have gigs from Fiverr actively. I think it has to do with your approach to how in a room full of people that are used to paying very, very low for something, how do you come in with value without yeah. trying to lowball? Like don't race to the bottom by charging $5, $10, whatever when you could be charging three to 500 to a thousand dollars per minute just by going to a different room. So it's, it's that balance, but continue. What else mm. have you tried? So yeah, I haven't delved at all into game audio packs, but it's one thing that I've thought about so a lot of the time when I was looking uh, online, just looking to see what other people have done. Again, I'm just looking at it thinking, Oh, it's so saturated. And it was the same when I was thinking about library music. I was like, mm. it's so saturated. It's, okay, like realistically, if I put a lot of time and effort into this, am I really going to get anything out of it to warrant putting that much time into it? Um, or maybe it's just, you know, I need to approach people with my game packs rather than just have them, you know, somewhere on the Unity website, for example. Right. Okay. So let's hit both of those because those are both possible avenues. And perhaps at the end of this, we can choose one that you think would, would be a better first step. So we talked about reaching out to game devs through Twitter. We also talked about um, creating music packs, essentially, to attract. So in your messages on Twitter, I'm curious, what have you said in there? Have you made any promises? Have you offered anything for free? Or is it just, can I work on your game? How did that work? I've tried um, your, your, your script that you've put out there. And what's nice is before I found that, I often just didn't get replies at all. And, it, you know, I just say like, hey, I'm just wondering, you know, do you need a composer? If so, I'd love to work on your game. Here's a link. Or, since I sort of use your script, people have got back to me. It hasn't worked yet. But then again, you know, I, I did see lots of people, you need to do about 50 a day. So I haven't got to that point yet. Okay. Um, so I'm not disheartened by it. But they definitely have got back to me in a nicer sense. And there is something about saying, you know, we'll keep you in mind if anything else comes up. You know, whether that's empty words or not, there's still that, that chance that, you know, they'll think of me when they need something new. Okay. So in those messages, uh, have you gotten to a step where anybody has replied back and they said yes to free music from you? No. Not yet. Okay. What was a general response that you've received? I think I'm probably finding people that already have found a composer. Um, so like the last one was like, I messaged them shortly after I saw them post something um, on, it was just an indie dev hashtag um, saying, you know, we're thinking about looking for music soon, you know, within about four hours when I saw that I'd message, but within that period of time, they found someone. So they got back to me just saying, hey, really sorry, uh, but we have already found someone. Okay. Um, how many devs do you think you've reached out to using that method? Probably quite a low number. It will be, be around 30. Okay. And I, I haven't done it over like a long period of time, but probably okay. only about 30. Well, tried a few on Reddit as well. Got it. So that again, approach, it, it can work. And I've actually mm -hmm. landed two games doing that. Um, so I don't want to be someone that says it doesn't work. It, but that is literally a cold calling approach, right? Yeah, it's what yeah, of course. people selling knives do, right? Like they go door to door and they, 
essentially what you're doing is is you're interrupting someone's day to ask for something. But the reason that it can work is because you're offering something for free. So you are still giving value. So it's one of those things that it's definitely a numbers game that if you even want to have a shot at getting a real gig from direct messaging or even emails for that matter, then you have to just you have to do a lot. And that's why I recommend 50 a day mm-hmm. until you get one. And chances are it's, it's about a two, 2.5 to 5% turnover rate of people who actually say yes to a free track, which is not terrible. It just means that for every, what is that? Every 40 people that you reach out to, one will say yes to a free custom track. And then probably yeah. one out of three or four who you've actually written for will turn into a paid project. And th- that seems to be the odds with that, with cold calling. And I would recommend if you're going to go that way, you just have to increase your numbers and you have to mm-hmm. really dig into it. So another way, and this is actually what I was talking about just uh, today on the podcast um, and on the YouTube uh, video that just came out, which is literally three steps to find work as a composer um, for games. And if you remember in that chat, I was talking about, and it's, it's actually what this entire YouTube channel and podcast is about. It's the 10 steps to become a game composer. It's all about attracting people to us which is, it's just a, a paradigm shift. It's literally a different way. Instead of approaching them, they come to us. And any time that there is something that somebody wants and the other person has it, there's always this high ground, low ground situation where the person who has the thing, as composers, we're the, we're the ones that have the music that the game developers want. We have the thing, and so we can ask whatever price we want for it. And one of the challenges, as you've experienced, is when you approach game developers in, in almost like a cattle call way, and you get on a short list, that doesn't feel very good. You don't want to be shortlisted. You want to be the guy who's hired for the job, right? And I've been through that multiple times. Uh, I, I did it enough to be just, I don't want to say scarred from it, but just I loathed it. It's like, why hmm. am I doing this to myself? I want people to come to me. And of course, that's what we all want. And I, there is a way of doing that. And it does take a little bit more time up front investment in, in paving the materials that attract. But that's, that's why I talk so much about content, right? Creating YouTube videos, creating soundtrack or uh, SoundCloud tracks. If you want to make a podcast, do that. But the whole idea is to attract people to you. So let's, let's explore that for just a couple minutes. What do you think you could put out there online that would attract game developers to you to where you never had to send a DM again? Well, uh, one thing that I was actually thinking of doing recently was um, starting some kind of YouTube series where I was looking at the music of games that I love, uh, tracks that I love, breaking down, you know, why this works, you know, you know the harmony, instrumentation, etc., and then rescoring that scene or that area, not copying, but sort of using the elements that work and then making my own thing. That's one thing I've been thinking about doing lately. And then that way I'm building a portfolio. I'd also be working on my um, video editing skills, which are subpar um, Mm. and things like that. And, you know, maybe build an audience that way. That's one thing I've thought about doing. By you creating that YouTube series, I think that there are three or four things that would really be valuable for different types of people. And it creates a lot of revenue sources for you. So first we have uh, other composers, right? That's an amazing way to, to teach other composers. And heck, if you ever wanted to turn that into a course or something, or, or just create a platform to answer questions from other composers, it's a really good way to use that time. Two, which is the most... Uh, needed for your business is to attract game developers. So if you're writing music on specific games or genres that you love, then you're going to be attracting those fans of those games who are also developers. And it's going to be able to serve them really well. And then on top of that, you're going to be creating your own music tracks that you could use as a portfolio, as a demo reel, or heck, go sell them as a game music pack. So what's really interesting is the very first thing you brought up today was 
which should I do, this or this? You don't have to choose. You can literally choose one activity that generates long-term. And that's exactly what I do. That is the purpose of the live composing show. People don't know that, but it's, it is what you want it to be, which is a very mm. nebulous thing to say. But if you're there to learn how to compose, then of course that's going to be good for you. But if you're a game developer who wants to see how I write 2D adventure games, you're going to be able to learn how I do it and you're going to get a lot of trust. And this is actually why I do that for them because I've actually had um, like Monster Sanctuary. I had the devs come and watch the streams and we get to have conversations afterwards where they've actually said, you know what? That one thing you did at one hour and 35 minutes that didn't make it into the final track. Can we put that little slice in the final track? Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Like that's never been possible in history aside from you know, maybe in the film world, having the director in the room with you while you compose or something. Um, it's just wild that that's a thing. And then I also use the live composing show because I'm writing demos for games as well as commercial. Obviously, it's scheduling time in my routine to write commercial games, like to write the music I have to write anyway. But it's also, if I'm writing demos, either it's for like sample libraries where I can get affiliate commissions and sponsorships, or it's for uh, games and it's for demos that I'm pitching for. At the end of the day, I have now all, a ton of assets. And so right now in my folder of, of finished tracks, they don't live anywhere. They're not sold as music packs and they're not online anywhere. Um, I have about 100 right now, which is crazy to me that I, that I have that much that I'm not selling, that not, that's not making me money. And, and I, you can sell those as music packs or you could go one extra step and stream them on Spotify as well. Yeah. It, it, so your by that one core activity, that could literally be your business. Mm. Yeah, it's something that the, the, the problem that I have, and it, this is a personal thing, because I can't really ask you this question, like how do I motivate myself? But that, that is the problem that I have sometimes. It's just I sometimes struggle with, well, okay, but it's not going to be good enough. Okay, but you know it's it's not going to attract the people I want to attract, and so I just don't do things sometimes. Um, yeah, I think that's extremely common in the creative industry, whether that's you know art or music or sound or whatever. Um, I think that's just part of the discipline. There are many days, even as a as a professional composer, there are many days I don't want to write, but that's why I have reshaped my schedule multiple times um and my current schedule in in light of covid and and everyone being quarantined and such my family is mostly here with me um and i have found that i've had to completely redo my schedule to be to kind of orbit around conversations like this and i don't know being um multifaceted so every action I do that's in my calendar solves multiple problems at once. And I don't think that's going to happen overnight. That's not something you just start a business and say, yeah, of course, yeah. how, how, many, <laughs> how many tasks can I combine into one? But I can say at the very beginning, if nothing else, do a podcast or do a YouTube channel. That just seems to be the trend in efficiency because I, mm. I would... First, recommend a YouTube channel over a podcast. Not that one is greater than the other, but a YouTube channel, because it's video, can be converted into audio only. You can't go vice versa. You can't turn a podcast into a YouTube. Um, but what's so neat is by trying to stack as many things on top of each other as possible with a YouTube channel, then you can convert it into anything else. And so that's why I truly believe that the more income you make in I mean, really anything, but specifically game music, the more income you make and the, I guess the more projects that people ask you to do, your time actually decreases, not increases. So my working hours are currently about 15 hours a week. They used to be about 30 or 40. And then before that, they were 50 or 60. And my goal is to get down to about four or five hours a week. And that's crazy. Like that's so controversial yeah. to yeah. our, I don't know, our current culture 
you know, I'm in America, so it's definitely an American culture thing of grind, 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 work, 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 work till you're dead. I'm like, that's not a life. Yeah. That doesn't serve my family. That doesn't serve my clients. I would much rather have way less to do, get paid really high for it, and enjoy my life. I would rather have one game project and it last a year or two, have one consistent piece of content that I deliver every single week. And that's what the 10 steps are all about. Becoming a game composer. It's all about basically having a show. Like if I could boil it down to one word, it's having a show. Something that's episodic. Something that is weekly. And doesn't mean you have to actually be present every week. That's just, that's a luxury I get to have right now in my schedule. Because I know Thursdays at 12, every single week I'm available. And that's something that I protect in my life. Because I know how valuable that is. Having a live composing show. Because if someone asks if I can write for their game and I don't have time, I can make time for that because that will happen every week. In the same way that if I don't have time, I don't. I really don't have time to write game music packs. It used to be something I did. I dedicated time to doing. I don't feel the need to do that because it's going to naturally happen. Just by writing every week at that same time, it's going to force me to have these assets to sell. Anytime that you can align your different goals into one, and just make it one consistent goal. I just, even on the days that you don't want to do it and you're not motivated, I think that's, you got to pick the consistency that works for your life. So I don't yeah. know. Let me ask you this. Are you more motivated when someone else is in the room or when you're by yourself? You know, ordinarily I would have said when I'm by myself, but I think looking back, I've actually, I spent most of lockdown at my girlfriend's and I had a little, m32 keyboard there like that was my only equipment my m32 keyboard my laptop and my hard drive and funnily enough because she had to go back to working from home so we'd sit in the same room and so she'd be working i think oh, what am i going to do i've got my m32 and because there was someone else there and i felt like well if you're working i should be working in that situation i was more motivated to constantly be working because otherwise i was like well I'm, otherwise i'm bored i can't <laughs> can't hang out with you you're working so in that situation i'd say with other people but then there's also been times when i'm at home and if i just get one little idea for the rest of the day i'm just like i've got that idea i'm gonna just keep going on that until that becomes something um so it i don't know if i really like, answered that question <laughs> well it sounds like both are important to you yeah. So I don't think you have to choose one over the other, but it sounds like you need both in your life. So mm -hmm. I think it's important for you to set a schedule for yourself that aligns around that. So perhaps like me, you want to have a live composing show where you have live people in the room and it might start off with a few and then it turns into dozens and then hundreds and all of a sudden the pressure is really real, but it's also really fun to be mm -hmm. able to answer questions as you go and to engage with people. And of course, it's virtual. It's not like real people are in the room with you, but there is something about that excitement and that energy that's just not there when you're by yourself. And so mm -hmm. likewise, I, as much as I love having that on Thursdays each week, I also have to have personal writing time where I'm just, no one sees it, no one's judging, no one's giving feedback because if you always get feedback, then you'll always be trying to please people right but if you really can just do your own thing i think it's good to have both so my encouragement to you is to set up a schedule that does both and regardless of what you choose be consistent that's really it um that's how you build anything in life anything worthwhile takes time yeah, yeah. and it takes consistency those are really the two words to focus on do you think there's any benefit in learning Unity and middleware and things like that? Because I, I started doing the WISE free courses that you could do, and I enjoyed it. I know it was a lot more about audio. I haven't looked at FMOD so much, but I feel like that's what I'd probably be more interested in. Um, do you think there's any benefits to that in this field or just focus on the writing? Do you have any hope or desire to be a sound designer? to create sound effects for games. Regardless of money and opportunities, is that something you really love? I'd love to learn about it. I don't know whether it's something that I'd pursue, but I'd love to know that I had 
you know, if someone, if I was asked to write the music, I knew I could do that. And I was like, oh, is there any chance you could do the sound effects as well? Because we're on a tight budget, et cetera, we need a bit more. I, I'd hate to say, oh, I'm really sorry. I have no idea. Yeah. Well, I think that that's your answer then. Um, I think it ultimately depends on what you want your end skill set to be. The only, you know, devil's advocate side to that is if you are going to pursue sound design in any way, I do think it'll help you in your music career. Um, but there will always come a point as you progress in your career. You're totally right that on the indie level, that's very common to be asked to do both music and sound. But ha what happens is as you kind of, I don't want to say climb the ranks, but just as more hi higher profile projects come to you, there's almost always a dedicated sound person and they want yeah. someone who is the dedicated person. So it will always come at some point, whether it's three, five, 10 years down the road, it just happens. And so you have to make a decision at that point or you have to stay at the lower budget games for the rest of your career. And mm -hmm. that's just a choice you have to make. And that's, that's a decision I had to make. Um, I've toyed with sound design enough to know that I don't want to make a career out of it because I love music too much. And it's, yeah, it's like choosing between your kids, right? It's just like first, second, third, <laughs> but you do at some point you, do you want to be a jack of all trades or a master of one? I think I, you know, of, uh, that's, I think in terms of like music for a long time, when I was at school and uni, it, I was very spread in terms of I, I didn't really know what I wanted to go into. I I played the piano to a good standard uh, when I started learning how to compose. That was to a good standard. Theory, uh, doing analysis was to a you know like a good standard. It, it was it, it took me a long time before I realised. Uh, composition and I wish that I'd done instead of a music degree I wish I'd done like a composition degree specifically and just put my all into that even though I did pick up a lot of skills a lot of them I haven't used <laughs> it's like sense yeah. and it's like it would have been nice if I just knew straight away actually no this is what I want to go into yeah so you, I think you have to balance those two worlds of if you're curious about something go scratch the itch yeah. or else you're always going to wonder what if right and also know that your time's never wasted when you spend time in audio, period. Mm. I've done a lot of side jobs over my career, like even just mixing bands or recording studios or m placing microphones in an orchestra or like conducting. There's so many little skills. You just don't know when you're going to use them again, but they all help you. They all give you different perspectives. So I'm never going to say just don't do it, but I mm. think that you have to weigh your priorities. Um, if you have those little curiosities, go explore it and then kind of come back and decide, okay, is it something that I really want to get better at? Because to truly be a master of something, you really got to spend about 10 to 20 years on it. Yeah. And that's about it. Like, that's just the truth. The, the, that's where the, the master craftsmen and the artisans of our world, they get paid the most because they are a master of one thing. Just kind of keep that in mind as you, you know, you choose your schedule and, and all that. Well, cool, man. That is all the time we have for today. But William, uh, just an absolute pre pleasure to get to speak with you today. And as always, if you have more questions, um, let me know. And I'm happy to answer those. And, and for anyone watching, um, if you want to take, take advantage of the 10 steps to become a game composer, that's really the, the crux of what we're talking about here today. And and how to attract clients to you versus always having to pursue them. Um, you can go to stevemalin.com slash 10 steps to check that out and hope that that serves you well. Thank you so much, William. Hope you have a great day and I will talk to you later. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thanks, man.